Let's get started. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Evgeny Marozov. I'm a writer and journalist writing about technology and democracy and politics. Um, I'm also involved with a series of uh, lectures and talks that are held at uh, this place, at SSSB, this uh, year. We've had, uh, for those of you who came to our previous event, we've hosted Brian Eno. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was a very interesting conversation. Today we have Mariana Mazzucato, and I'm going to be very proud to have her. I'm going to talk a little bit more about her and her work in a second, but let me just announce that we're also going to have uh, another event uh, in about a month. On May 25th, uh, we'll have uh, Linda Weiss, uh, a very interesting scholar, also of innovation policy and uh, politics. Uh, she'll be here to share her insights uh, with us. Uh, the whole series is dedicated to technology, um, sovereignty, and globalization. So all of the events in the series are more or less related to those themes. We also have another event in June with Raquel Rolnik. Uh, you'll probably find flyers announcing our talks uh, somewhere here around this building. And if not, you can always check online. Uh, unfortunately, the event with Roberto Unger, which was supposed to take place in a couple of weeks, uh, will not be happening because he's had a knee operation, unfortunately, a couple of weeks ago. So he's not really able to travel. Nonetheless, we are expecting to see you here uh, for the two remaining events that we have. And as for tonight, uh, as I've said, we're very proud to have Mariana Matsukato here with us. She's a very prominent um, academic and author and public intellectual. Uh, she is currently a professor in the economics of innovation and public value at the University College London, where she's also establishing uh, a new institute for innovation and public purpose. Uh, she's the author of a very highly acclaimed book, The Entrepreneurial State, Debunking Public versus Private Sector Myth. Uh, which has won uh, a couple of very important prizes. Uh, she has also regularly advanced, uh, uh, regularly advised uh, numerous policymakers and governments, and um, uh, that list is quite long and impressive. Uh, I would probably mention also a new book that she has just co-edited called Rethinking Capitalism, Economics uh, and Policy for Sustainable Inclusive Growth. Uh, she's also currently finishing, or maybe already finished, uh, a new book called The Value of Everything, which uh, should be published by Alan Lane this year. Yeah. yeah? Good, in September. So um, why don't we kick it off with maybe half an hour or so, a few remarks, and then I'll pose some questions and we'll have a Q&A, and the hope is that we'll be out of here by 7.55 or so, because both of us have to catch a plane later tonight. So let's hope it doesn't go too long. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm going to put on my timer. Last time I did this, I had a timer, and then I started getting texts from the babysitter saying she couldn't find my children. So I had to say, excuse me, one second, a few minutes, quickly. <laughs> but this time I put it on sleep mode. Ooh. Okay, so I want to be quite quick because oof, I especially will value very much the discussion with you, but also with, um, in particular, Evgeny in terms of his questions, because I think we've been both critiquing a similar system, but from very different lenses. And this is a great opportunity for me to unite. So, um, so forgive me if I go too quickly on some slides. Just close your eyes if you get uh, dizzy. But that's because I really want to stick to 30 minutes so that we actually, again, have time for discussion. And those of you who might have dared to look on YouTube and stuff, I'm sort of embarrassed, but not really, because I, I give this lecture a lot. Why? Not because I have nothing else to say. I have so much to say. Just kidding. But, you know, because I really believe in the points that I'm going to be making, and unfortunately, I don't see much change. Um, and so I'm sort of hammering in the point, and it'll be a bit ironic because I will be at some point mentioning the word mission orientation needed in policies, but I also sort of see myself on a mission myself, um, sort of guerrilla warfare out there to try to really convince policymakers to think very differently, but also that if we're going to be talking about, you know, these sexy words like ecosystems and partnerships, which seem to be on the tongue of every policymaker to actually really build them in a way that is more symbiotic and mutualistic and less parasitic. I see lots of predator prey types of partnerships out there, and surely that's not what we want. So anyway, until I see change, I will keep repeating myself. Um, so first of all, and I think this is important for the Spanish context, I think that what happened after the crisis was a really exciting 
potential new conversation, <laughs> there was an opportunity to have a new conversation because there wasn't a lack of growth before the financial crisis. There was a problem in its direction. Think of Spain, but also the UK. In the, U in, in the US, there was, again, plenty of growth in the 1990s, but it was basically driven by you know, private consumption-led growth fueled by debt that then people couldn't actually pay back because real incomes hadn't really increased and still are not increasing since the 1980s. So this private debt uh, financialized form of growth was really seen as a, as a problem. And in the hope of also rebalancing economies, there began to be quite a bit of discussion, not just of how do we get growth back, but what then kind of direction do we need for that growth? Now, so these trendy words here that for anyone who works at the, uh, with the European Commission, like Francesca, who tells me she's up there a lot, will see these words plastered everywhere. Now, smart growth, inclusive growth, sustainable growth. And you know, it's, it's, it's important, it's actually quite revolutionary to take these words seriously. Spain today is, is, is growing, but not in this way. The UK today is growing, not in this way. So this actually could become a radical, revolutionary economic program. And unfortunately, it's, it's not being treated that way. Uh, by the way, the UK today, and I'd be curious to see your figures, but the UK today has a ratio of private debt to disposable income. Yeah, all this talk about public debt. Private debt to disposable income, which is at record levels, back to close to record levels, which is what caused the crisis in the first place. So we should be worried, OK? Um, anyway, so on the one hand, there is this great new potential conversation, and on the other hand, there is continuing to be, and I think this is one of the real problems and why we haven't moved on and why we haven't achieved you know, a different type of growth, this very boring and lame view of the policymaking process itself. We know by definition that growth on its own, markets on their own, don't achieve those kinds of growth for the reasons I said. So obviously economic policy matters, but what's the role of policy? Is it just to sort of tinker on the edges, to fix different types of market failures, to level the playing field, to de-risk uh, uh, the private sector and then get the hell out of the way? Or is it something else? And really, I guess what I'm arguing as a, again, a mission kind of crazy woman going around the world is, you know, there is another way. There's another way that we could actually be thinking about economic policy. I feel very sorry for those of you with earphones, because I assume I'm talking way too fast to be translated. But it's your fault. You should just take them off and try to hear. <laughs> um, anyway, so in economics, we think we're very fancy and we build beautiful uh, economic models, which basically are built on this boring, lame, narrow way of thinking the, the, the policy process. And this is about, as I said before, coming in and fixing different types of problems. So in the innovation space, the most obvious problem is when you have strong positive externalities and public goods, then the private sector doesn't invest enough in it, and so the state must come in and you know, fix that problem and, for example, invest in basic science. Or if you have negative externalities like pollution, you might need a carbon tax, not the state coming in with another bandage. All these market failures exist. In fact, the financial crisis could be seen as the biggest market failure ever. But what's, what's my point really is, in a nutshell, is that to really understand the interesting things that have happened basically in capitalism for the last 200 years, it would be very hard actually to understand it just through this you know, role of policy in that uh, um, market creation process is just fixing things. And unfortunately, we are constantly fed, constantly in the media, but not only, this role of that, again, this boring role of seeing the policy making process by uh, different types of um, uh, newspapers. The Economist is famous for it because they don't get tired, like I don't get tired repeating myself, they don't get tired of saying, okay, of course we need the state, we're not stupid, we're not the Tea Party, but hey, you know, know your place. So invest in education, invest in skills, invest in infrastructure, but then out of the way and let the revolutionaries do their thing. And who are the revolutionaries? They are these guys, no? The Zuckerbergs, the Steve Jobses, the Bill Gateses, I'm sure you have your equivalents in Spain. In the UK, we have a guy who made vacuum cleaners and became very famous, so David Dyson. Anyway, um, 
And, and so the idea is that these guys create value, yeah? They're entrepreneurs, they're dynamic, they're really cool. And yes, we need the policy making process here to regulate, to get the right tax system, to level the playing field, to fund the basics. But then please, know your place and get out. Um, and so what I tried to do in this book called The Entrepreneurial State was to kind of reverse <laughs> the, the scenario, not, not to say that these guys are not important, but to say there's nothing in the DNA of these guys or these guys that necessarily make one more creative than the other. What actually matters is actually understanding in history what kind of businesses, what was going on in the business community when things that were interesting happened. Similarly, inside the public sector, inside the organizational capacity of particular types of agencies, from the BBC to a particular public bank to DARPA, very important R&D agency, what was actually happening inside and how might we address these great grand challenges of the future, whether related to climate change or health, in terms of actually giving attention to the organizations within the public and the private sector, but especially their relationships, right? Less parasitic, less predator to prey, more symbiotic, more mutualistic, and more about co-investing together in the future opportunities that might get us a better type of economy. And so I called it the entrepreneurial state, but, and I'm sorry for this, as I always say, self-promotional slide, but then I keep putting it up, but the titles to me are quite important, especially the German one, Das Kapital, the stat, because actually it really, in some ways, encapsulates the point. You know, the state is not just lender of last resort. It should be also lender of last resort. And in Europe, it would have been nice if, you know, the central bank in the, Europe, the European Central Bank did its job as the lender of last resort at the right time. But that's not enough. It's also investor of first resort. And in order to do interesting things, it doesn't just have to de-risk the private sector, but take risks. So think of the word entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial, not just to describe a garage tinkerer or some entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, but the willingness and the ability, the capacity to take on risks, to take on uncertainty, to even have a vision about future possibilities. And, um, and that to me was very important to, again, change the language. And I used to make fun of my postmodernist friends and all their talk about discourse. And now I've st started to sort of use the word discourse probably in a very different way myself, because I think, as Tony Jutt famously said in a great book he wrote called Ill Fares the Land, we have a discursive crisis when we talk about the state. We literally don't have the words to talk about the kind of ambition that was needed, for example, to even set up the welfare state. And that in some ways, what we've been witnessing since the 1970s has not been just about things like austerity and you know that, but actually a, a, a discursive attack on the role of policymaking as doing anything more than those words I said before. And what, in some ways, the entrepreneurial state tries to do, as well as some new work I'm doing with others, is create a very different type of framework, which I call market shaping and market creating, not just market fixing. But obviously, the state doesn't shape and create on its own. It's co-shaping, co-creating with different types of actors. And also, we should be kind of aware of what is it we're creating. Are we going in the right direction, changing the debate? and very much changing the language from de-risking to taking risks, from leveling to tilting the playing field towards sustainable, smart, inclusive growth, from simply enabling the wealth creators to you know, really catalyzing, and again, playing that investor of first resort, from fixing to shaping, creating. And of course, this then has a lot to do with the key point of my lecture, if I get to it, so which is in the title, which is that it's not enough to talk about the need to redistribute wealth or tax wealth, as important as that is. We also need a different understanding of where wealth came from in the first place. So as great as Piketty's book is, I think one of the um, you know, things to do next after you say and, and show how problematic wealth distribution has um, been since the 1970s is actually to construct a different understanding of where that wealth came from and map that different understanding into our understanding of how the wealth should be distributed. Yeah, so not just redistributing, but 
a different understanding of where it came from. And um, recently, just in order to organize my own thoughts, I've sort of thought of what the big four questions are, I think, for the future of policymaking. Let me just quickly run through these, um, just kind of to state them, and then what I'll do for the next, um, oh God, oh good, 18 minutes, not 10 minutes, uh, <laughs> uh, minutes that I have um, to sort of give you a hint about each one. But first, we should get over this psychological problem that we have, that we always hear, you know, policymakers saying, yeah, you know, we're going to do some great things, but oh, don't worry, we're not going to pick winners, or, you know, we're not going to crowd out the, the private sector. So to get over it, meaning, you know, that's not the question, picking or not picking. We have to make choices. We have to have strategic deliberation inside uh, the policymaking process, just like we need it in the business community. What we actually need is a better understanding of how to create, a, uh, a, if you want, a delicate uh, a balance between, on the one hand, directing the economy, for example, around smart, sustainable, inclusive objectives, also making quite concrete choices going to the moon or solving climate change, but then underneath that really enabling kind of bottom-up experimentation, different types of, uh, again, partnerships, explorative capacity that can enable, if you want, creativity, but the point is not to not direct the economy. When you don't direct the economy, you get the kind of growth we had in the 1990s. Um, then, if we're gonna be shaping and creating markets, not just fixing them, what does this mean for the organizational capacity of uh, the, the actual public institutions in question? Uh, how can we build learning organizations that are able to actually you know, explore, maybe trip along the way, make some mistakes, but also learn from that? What does it mean for the investments inside the state structures, the different types of public institutions, to instead of outsourcing knowledge, as we continually see, from different types of governments thinking, believing the economist cartoon, you know, you're not very useful, so get out of the way, so why should we invest in our knowledge? So instead of doing that, how can we create knowledge organizations inside uh, the public sector precisely also to be a better partner? Business surely won't benefit from having a, a boring and not very intelligent uh, public partner, uh, but also in order to negotiate better uh, what these partnerships actually mean. Then how do we assess, how do we evaluate ambitious market shaping, market creating policies? Again, whether it's in space, whether it's around a new green direction for the economy, whether it's confronting the big demographic and care challenge that many economies have, are undergoing, if it's not just about fixing markets but uh, actively shaping and creating them, what does that mean for how we assess those policies? It's not enough to do great things. If then you're accused because of our static cost-benefit uh, analysis of being too ambitious, you know, crowding out the private sector, as the BBC was accused last year of crowding out private broadcasters, then we have a problem. And lastly, the title of the talk, so hopefully I'll get there, um, how do we not just socialize risks but also rewards, precisely in order to get that mutualistic, uh, interesting, healthy tension between the different partners involved. Okay, so quickly, I'm gonna be quite quick, especially hopefully with the first one, which I tend to sometimes uh, delve into much, this issue of, you know, stop saying you don't pick, let's talk about how this might occur. And you know, what's interesting for anyone who knows anything about innovation is that the big innovations that actually affected productivity across many different sectors, what economists call general purpose technologies, in fact, would be impossible to understand simply through this boring you know, fixing of problems versus more ambitious kinds of policies which very actively actually, in some ways, directed these uh, uh, different types of technologies to come into being, of course, along with the private sector. Um, and if, if, if you actually look at the innovation chain itself, which you know, begins with basic research, then there's applied research, early stage financing for the few companies even interesting, interested in innovating, and all the feedback relationships between those. Innovation is not linear, it's very non-linear, very serendipitous, Viagra. They were looking for a heart medicine, then something else popped up, right? That's actually quite common. No one's laughing and, <laughs> uh, with innovation. And then even the demand side policies, which might be about procurement or other ambitious policies, which um, my colleague Carlota Perez talks about, you know, the role of the public 
uh, agencies across this innovation chain went way beyond just fixing the basic science problem. I should pause a minute and say that many countries, including Spain and Italy, where I'm from, don't spend enough in basic science, the sort of upstream public good market failure. But even if they did, you wouldn't get you know, great innovation because you need a lot more, not just the basic science. And what's interesting is if you look, again, across there and look at some of these orange acronyms, who, which I think you'll be hearing also from Linda Weiss when she comes, um, you know, they, they were also very mission oriented. There were different types of agencies really thinking about uh, actively shaping and creating a different space, whether it was in health, the internet, of course, having come out of DARPA, um, mainly not only in the Department of Defense, ARPA-E today being cut by Trump as we speak. Uh, uh, sister organization of DARPA, but in the Department of Energy. Um, it, it'd be very hard to understand you know, their role if you just saw them as coming in and putting different types of bandages. And the example I give in the uh, book is you know, when conservatives, if they don't like what I'm saying, I say throw away your smartphone, because every smart product you have, what makes that product smart and not stupid was in fact some sort of public actor that did have vision around these revolutionary technologies like the internet, GPS, touchscreen display, Siri voice activated system, the products inside your smartphone. Which is not to say that the companies like Apple were not important, but it's to say that you know what would Steve Jobs and his team, including Sir John Ives, have put together in this really cool way that they did had there, there not been these revolutionary technologies. So they surfed a massive wave. And the problem is that when you have a book on Steve Jobs, which is a very good book, and a movie made on the book, where not one page, not one paragraph, not one sentence, not one word, one little word, is on any of this public funding, that's when we have a very you know, problematic storytelling uh, about innovation. So it's not to say that the individuals didn't matter, but why have we completely dismissed the role of the public sector beyond you know, the basics, some education, skills, and science? Um, and and uh, you know, what does that then mean for both innovation policy, when countries try to copy the Silicon Valley model and not really get what happened, but also what does it mean for the returns that then are distributed from the very high profits that are generated from these kinds of products. And this is the point. There's a relationship between the storytelling and the returns. And Plato, already back a long time ago, kind of got that when he said, storytellers rule the world. So in many ways, what I'm trying to do is change the storytelling around innovation so we better understand how this ruling occurs with this very problematic discourse. Um, Linda Weiss will probably uh, tell you, be careful, look at all this uh, military stuff here, right? So the Army, the Navy, DARPA, and the Department of Defense, the CIA uh, has a, a very big public venture capital fund called InQtel. Um, but what's luckily a part of the story is that, yes, much of this came out of the military industrial complex through security concerns, but luckily the lessons were also learned in other areas. And surely today around both health and energy around the world, lots, again, of the you know, revolutionary and you know, high capital intensive, high risk, high uncertain uh, uh, parts of those uh, value creations continue to be funded by different types of public actors. This is, again, focusing on the US, the National Institutes of Health, where two things are very important here. Uh, first is that just how, well, three things, how long this funding has been happening. And it literally, you can think of this as a wave. Looks like a wave, un onda, no? Which was literally surfed by the venture capital community out there in California because they came in sort of here, yeah? They did not create biotech. They very much surfed a wave of very high risk, high uncertain, high capital intensive public financing and came in the middle. It would be fine as long as we admitted it, <laughs> that that's what happened, a division of innovative labor, not the VCs being the big risk takers. They came in later and they didn't finance the, the early stage uh, uh, a high risk phase. Um, in fact, I should, I should have just paused a minute. This one here, SBIR, is a very important public uh, fund in the US through procurement that has historically provided the very early stage high risk financing for the companies themselves. But anyway, this wave was massively surfed as well as um, 
what else I was going to say about this? Yeah, this, there's some very interesting studies that have also linked this financing to uh, some of the most revolutionary drugs. The new molecular entities with priority rating actually get their research from these pots. So this notion that the revolutionaries are in business and the public sector is there as a Kafkian boring bureaucrat in this particular sector is very interesting to look at because we have great data on you know, which drugs are just me too drugs versus really revolutionary new drugs. Um, and both the NIH, this pot of money, and ARPA-E literally are today under big attack by Trump, which is interesting because Reagan, who's often you know, put out there with Thatcher, the Reagan Thatcher years, actually didn't cut this funding. If anything, he increased it. So you know, Thatcher and Reagan were very problematic with the welfare state, but at least in the US, Reagan didn't uh, threaten these pots of money. So in some ways, the US is in a very unique moment today that it has never experienced with such a frontal, explicit attack on these uh, wealth-creating public agencies. Um, and the question is, what will happen to US competitiveness? And I can tell you, many countries are, are, are smiling. China is very happy that the US is unfinancing its key source of competitiveness. Um, but in green, we see the same thing as we saw in you know, nanotech, biotech, internet, which is that some of the highest risk and uncertain parts of it continue to be financed by different types of public actors, including, interestingly for green, not so much for IT, public banks. So that first big green bit there are basically four public banks the Chinese, the German, the European, and the Brazilian. And it's, it's interesting to look at the actual financing uh, because it's not just counter-cyclical, the classic role that some of these banks are assumed to do, but also very much directing that finance, such as the KFW's, uh, which is the German public bank financing of uh, climate change, climate protection projects as part of its um, energy event policy. And China, if you look at what the China Development Bank does, it might look surprising, but when you look at these figures, you should remember <laughs> the, the amounts of money that went into the technologies that I was talking about behind the, um, you know, the iPhone, but also today, someone like Elon Musk, the new hero of Silicon Valley, um, got over $5 billion, billion dollars from the US government for his uh, three companies, uh, Solar City, SpaceX, and Tesla. Tesla got, just for the Tesla S car, $465 million and a guaranteed loan. Anyway, let me move on. Organizations. So when you actually look at this, you know, not big, top-down, big brother, blah, state, but this network of different types of public institutions distributed across that whole chain, it's quite interesting, again, as I said before, to look at their own mission statements and how this was also related to attracting top people to even want to work inside these organizations. When we sometimes hear, oh, a public bank can do nothing because, God, these civil servants, they don't know how to invest. Well, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more we think that the public sector is going to be boring, the more we talk about it like that, the more we theorize about it as just fixing market failures, we should ask ourselves if that also affects who wants to work inside the civil service. And it's quite difficult to attract top talent um, if that's the way we talk about it. Recently, the Department of Energy in the US was run by a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Steve Chu, and you know, he thought it was an honor to direct the Department of Energy. And this was not independent from the fact that it was at a time in 2009 when the US, unlike Europe, <laughs> actually had a stimulus program, 800 billion, and at least originally very much directed around green. Um, and he, in fact, set up ARPA-E in 2009. And you know, again, ambition and ability to attract people like Nobel Prize winners is, is an interesting, at least, problem to pose oneself if, if we're going to have ambition. And I had the luck of uh, meeting Cheryl Martin, who was one of the first directors of ARPA-E when I organized a conference around these issues back in 2014. And she said, yeah, well, you know, when we have ambition, we have to also admit that there's going to be quite a bit of risks, and we're going to have to fail, we're going to have to trip, and we're going to have to learn from that process. And especially, we shouldn't worry so much about the risks and the failures, but that our successes, once they do happen, actually have real impact. So not just a little gadget that maybe affects one sector, but something like new battery storage technology, which ARPA-E recently was the key innovator for, and you know, being able also to map that process. As well as, as I mentioned before, welcoming experimentation, exploration, or what this wonderful economist Albert Hirschman called 
the hiding hand, this welcoming the serendipity process. Let me move on. Assessment. As I said, you can't just do this great stuff if then the evaluators come in and tell you to stop. You know, you must go back to just leveling and fixing and don't have ambition. Um, and Keynes, I think, I, I often put this up even though it's too long to read, but just read the, the, yeah, the orange bit. You know, the word animal spirits, you might have heard, you know, is, is a word that came from Keynes's understanding of some problems that can occur with the very volatile and pro-cyclical form of investment. But in this wonderful letter he wrote to Roosevelt, he basically was saying, oh God, I have a problem here. You know, this word, animal spirits, makes you think of lions and tigers and pussycats and, and wolves, but actually what we have in the business community are often just hamsters and gerbils and pussycats, so domesticated animals. And in fact, what these different types of ambitious, mission-oriented policies that I've been talking about have done is in some ways created endogenously these animal spirits. So instead of assuming you have a lion in a cage that wants to roar and wants to innovate, thinking of it as a domesticated animal and a pussycat means that you shouldn't focus on just removing impediments like regulation, take it away, taxes, take it away, but actually have that ambitious policy that gets the pussycats to want to grow up to be a lion and want to roar and you know, to crowd in, even though it's amazing we, we use the word crowd in as though it's something good, it still sounds like you're crowding someone, uh, you know, crowd in, get the business community excited about doing something. And this is in fact the history of big innovations where you weren't just fixing you know, a market, you were creating something new. Sorry, every time I go away from the, you can hear me, creating something new, and this crowding in, getting the business community exciting about this new space, you better have a way to capture, you know, that sort of movement and that excitement and that endogenous formation of animal spirits as opposed to just looking at how many bandages you formed and whether that particular bandage was too big or too small. Um, and I do think this actually raises a big question, which I don't have time to talk about, but I'm working on now, trying to build on the work of people like Barry Bozeman, who argues, you know, we actually have to better understand even what public value is, and both how to create it, but also how to evaluate, how to get to a mapping exercise that is able to capture it. And so, sorry, another self-promotional slide. Uh, the, the, my recent book, which as Jenny mentioned, I sort of unpick that word itself. And it was very interesting to me that I found that even Marx had no concept of public value. Uh, he obviously had a very strong theory of value, very interesting to analyze capitalism. But uh, even in Marx, government is not so much a value creator. He had, of course, as you know, his own understanding of, of, of government, which I don't have time. So in my last two minutes, <laughs> uh, and it's fine because I've sort of been building up to this, you know, what does all this mean then for the distribution of this great innovation-led growth. And in fact, the point is that by just talking about this policy process in this boring way as de-risking and leveling, it's then facilitated a lot of value extraction by the business community that has not been plugged back into the economy to really benefit the public if you want return. And so we've ended up socializing risks, but privatizing rewards. And the point is not just to tax the rewards, but to have a different understanding of where that wealth came from in the first place. And again, das Kapital de Stat, the capital of the state, investor first resort, well then think of it like a portfolio. And it's not enough to make those investments that will fail. For every successful Tesla, you'll have three or four cylindras literally set it up like a portfolio and get some of the returns perhaps directly from the upside successes to cover the inevitable downside losses. And this is not about R&D. Some of my <laughs> uh, critics, and I have many, um, Francesca knows them quite well, uh, <laughs> have especially focused on this thing, oh, she's saying the government should take out equity and R&D. No, the government is not just doing basic research. As I showed you, also funding a lot of applied research, even giving money to particular companies. You know, Intel and Compaq got money from the SBIR program. Apple itself got money from an SBIC program. The company itself, not just the technology. Tesla, 465 million guaranteed loan. Solyndra, 500 million guaranteed loan. Solyndra, bankrupt, uh, taxpayer picked up the bill. Why was no equity taken out in Tesla? And interestingly, Obama, 
who, as you know, had lots of Goldman Sachs guys in his administration, who created some problems, weren't there when he needed them. <laughs> the one time they should have spoken up was, hey guys, I know how to do investment. I'm from Goldman Sachs. Take some equity out of Tesla. What did they tell him to do? They told him, okay, when, you know, uh, when they took out the loan was 2009, they said, if you don't pay back the loan, if you don't pay it back, we're gonna get three million shares in your company. Why would you want three million shares in a company that it goes so bad that it can't pay back the loan? They should have done the opposite. And in fact, when Tesla did pay back the loan in 2013, the price per share had gone from nine to 90. And imagine the three million shares with that price difference, it would have more than covered the Solyndra loss in the next round. So thinking creatively on how to do that, I think is very important. But the first important bit is recognizing that this success, of course, came from, again, this very collective effort, which some wonderful entrepreneurs like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett admit, others like Peter Thiel don't, um, but also Warren Buffett, who is basically one of my heroes, and he's not a communist, but he sometimes sounds like one, says, you know, why did you reduce my capital gains? I don't even look at it. I look at opportunities. And in fact, everything I've been telling you is that the big opportunities that have driven business investment have actually come out of these different types of public funds. But then when you have stupid taxation policy that reduces the public budgets, we're putting in threat the future innovation. And in fact, uh, the actual tax policy that got this particular tax to fall by 50% in five years, which is what he's referring to here at the end of the 70s, was negotiated for in the name of innovation by the National Venture Capital Association. Not a coincidence. And all this inequality that Piketty has trained us to look at with his great data, which I think is a huge social service that he gave us, it's very interesting to look at the regressive policies in that period, why they need perhaps some changing, but also the stories that were told to policymakers on why those particular problematic taxes. The other thing is there's huge amounts of cash being hoarded, 2 trillion euros in Europe, 2 trillion, by chance, dollars in the US, uh, literally inert capital. Uh, Spain surely has lots of inert capital, so profits not being reinvested. Profits, by the way, are very high internationally, so the profit wage relationship is at record levels, but also this ultra financialization, so profits being used not to reinvest in human capital and skills of the workforce, not being used for research and development, but on things like share buybacks that boost stock prices, stock options, and executive pay. This is part of the innovation problem. It's not the robots we should fear. <laughs> Mechanization has displaced labor for 200 years. What was happening up until the 1980s is that the profits from today's innovation were being reinvested in tomorrow's areas which created other types of jobs. That's what we should be tackling, not these, you know, the robots are taking our jobs. I'm gonna stop now and just say there's all sorts of different ways in which we can socialize risks and rewards. It can happen through the price mechanism, for example, with the medicines <laughs> that are publicly financed. Why are the prices not reflecting that collective contribution? the kind of equity deals I mentioned for the downstream investments. We could better negotiate patents. Patents aren't the problem, it's what we're patenting that's the problem. We're increasingly patenting upstream, so the tools for research are being closed. We're going back to the Middle Ages of secrecy. Huge problem, patents are contracts. They should be better negotiated for public return. State investment banks, which I've mentioned, are playing a big role. They're quite interesting because they do have a return on equity. Anyway, there's no one golden rule, but you know, you, you don't even ask the question of how to earn a public return if the public is described like this. So think again. And that's it. Tire myself out. <laughs> All right. So maybe I will ask a very long question and then we'll see if. We need any follow-ups, and then we'll open up uh, and ask some more. Um, so I've enjoyed quite a bit uh, what I've heard. Um, I think the reason why uh, your work uh, excites and also provokes uh, is that um, at its heart is this very intriguing notion of the entrepreneurial state, right? And in a sense, I think it relies on um, two very interesting components, right? One of which is about the past, and one of them is about the future. 
right? So the component that is about the past, I think it offers a very necessary and intriguing um, revisionist, I would say, history mm -hmm. of how value, and especially in fields like technology and science, uh, has been created over the past 40 years. So the story that we traditionally hear in the media, but also coming out of places like Silicon Valley, is basically just a myth, right? So the idea of the entrepreneur working in the garage and being this uh, heroic figure that has just stepped out of a novel by Anne Rand, that story is not correct. Right? So the real story was different, and it involved this entrepreneurial state that has nurtured a lot of those efforts. Right? And uh, based on that first element about the past, right, uh, you articulate a vision of the future. So we have to learn something from that experience uh, in order to basically um, restructure how we innovate, right? in order to make it fit with our historical experience. And I think that you've given us a very persuasive um, answer as to why the traditional view of government involvement crowding out uh, innovators is incorrect. So on that count, I think you give us a very strong and persuasive set of arguments as to why the quotes we've seen from The Economist are not correct, right? Uh, and I buy that fully. Uh, but I'm not sure that that's the most uh, interesting critique uh, of the entrepreneurial state, right? And um, being here in uh, Catalonia and in Barcelona, where there was a very strong anarchist tradition historically, you can easily see at least two more critiques of the entrepreneurial state uh, based mostly on the historical reading of the situation and not the future. And the first one I would probably say is the idea, and you have indicated and hinted at that in your remarks, that the entrepreneurial state has always so often been also a war state. Mm -hmm. right? So ultimately, the reason why so much innovation has been created and produced in the United States in the period from 1940s onwards is because the US was in the middle of the Cold War, and that has allowed a lot of developments to flourish. Mm -hmm. right? And I think um, a lot of people see that and understand that. Uh, and there was quite a bit of discontent with the way in which science and technology was practiced during that era. So the movements of 1960s were all about challenging the hijacking of science and technology for the purposes of fighting the war in Vietnam and so forth. They wanted to radically democratize the process that was more or less dictated by the Pentagon and the planners over there. So. Um, that brings me to the second critique that can be made of the entrepreneurial state is that the entrepreneurial state, despite being entrepreneurial, still seems to be quite technocratic in that it still assumes that there is a set of bureaucrats or planners or some kind of higher authorities that formulate and dictate priorities with people more or less being on the receiving end as consumers or users of uh, gadgets or that more or less as one of the uh, consequences or conclusions one can draw from the story you've given. So, um, and then there are of course minor critiques that one can make in between those two, the work critique and the technocratic critique. So if you look at how the US uh, government functions now, uh, many people in Europe would say that, for better or worse, maybe even in the absence of the entrepreneurial state mindset, the U.S. seems to have produced companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and so forth. They have managed to draw on the legal and political power of the United States as a government in order to create the legal and technological regime in which they can come and extract as much data as they want from the countries where they operate by offering cheap and subsidized services funded by advertising, use that data to create artificial intelligence with the rest of the world more or less innovating on the edges. All you can do within that system is build apps. And it's those companies that are building self-driving cars using that data. It's those American companies that are building systems capable of using AI to analyze health. Uh, it's them 
right? The rest of the world is content with this celebration of entrepreneurship that's happening, uh, you know, at uh, all sorts of um, conferences and gatherings where the idea is that live the big industrial strategy of building those platforms to the big guys in Silicon Valley in America, everyone else uh, should be trying to build the next app because it's by building apps that you create disruption. That's another story that is quite prominent and appears in the narrative. And the question here is, to what extent all of those nuances, the geopolitical one, the historical one, uh, the uh, technocratic one, to what extent you can incorporate them into the idea of the entrepreneurial state? And to what extent do you think they actually need to be incorporated into it? Because again, listening to you, it wasn't obvious to me whether the democratization of technocratic expertise is something that you would welcome or favor, or whether it's something that you think uh, should not be done, because we do need those experts making decisions about science policy and so forth. And I think the question about, you did address it about the war and military when talking about Linda Weiss, but I think here, it's also not obvious that the story is over. I mean, if you look at green technologies, it was the Pentagon that has more or less put them on the agenda because, because of the data and the intelligence that they have accumulated, they have identified climate change as a geopolitical threat to the United States, which then triggered lots of investments in that field. So, an additional question here, and sorry, I'm giving too many, is to what extent, no, no, but, but to what extent this is something that can be implemented outside of the particular security rationales of the United States? Yeah, 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 yeah. no, it's very, um, sorry. Yeah? No, no, sure, I'm done. So, um, <laughs> Very, 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 not just good questions, good points, and things that um, I think about quite a bit, and you're right. I mean, it, well, this isn't an excuse, but I think I was trying to focus on how the current understanding of where innovation came from is then leading also to lots of problematic policies around the world that think they're copying Silicon Valley without even understanding it, and so also surprise, surprise, don't innovate. <laughs> uh, you know, Silicon Roundabout <laughs> in the UK, Tech City, is, is basically a failure, I think, because they have hyped up the you know, per bits of the story, not understanding most of it, but also, and this actually interests me much more, so much inequality that has been happening, which I really think is a huge problem, again, I agree with Piketty, has been happening through this very problematic storytelling. But these other aspects you've mentioned, I'm very happy you asked about them, because you've picked on bits which I chose on purpose or, or perhaps not on purpose to um, skip over quickly. First, because you did say something, and I, you, you reminded me that I didn't uh, say something, even though it wasn't uh, so much part of your question, but this isn't just about science and technology. Uh, your sort of first point about the past. It was also, and I briefly said, demand-side policies, not just through procurement, but mass production, huge technological revolution you know, at the beginning of the last century would not have had the effect it did on productivity, on different types of issues around production, distribution, and consumption across the economy, and basically growth, had there not been demand-side ambitious policies, forget if they're good or bad, it's not a normative point, things like suburbanization. And it, Carlota Perez, who I mentioned quickly, she has looked at this and she says, you know, what is the equivalent of suburbanization today? And she says, green. We should be using green as a direction, ambitious green policies, as directions through which to allow IT to be fully diffused and fully deployed throughout the economy. So instead of doing the Robert Gordon thing, which is secular stagnation, there's no big innovations anymore, and he puts the indoor toilet here, in the internet here and says, which one <laughs> would you get rid of <laughs> if you had to get rid of only one? The idea is you wouldn't want to go pee outside, maybe send some you know, fewer emails. The real issue there is, has IT benefited from ambitious demand side policies as um, mass production did? I just wanted to say that because otherwise it does seem like we're just talking about science and technology, and it's not. Your next point, which is, well, actually, I'm, I'm taking them a bit out of order, but anyway, this whole thing about security. well. Absolutely right, and that's why I, you know, I said yes, it was the military industrial complex, but it, what's interesting is how to transform that, both in the sense that um, you know, actually looking at how energy has gotten its funding besides the source, the source continues to be, even in the US, sometimes through the Defense Department, but the fact that it was framed 
It continues to be framed, I think, in a problematic way as an energy security problem. It's not a coincidence <laughs> by framing, and also that's another part of the storytelling, as though it's a security problem that, the, you know, that has also helped in some countries to, if you want, uh, uh, allow, if you want, the public budgets for those types of investments to be made. But think of Johnson. It was a failed war, but the war on poverty, again, it's not a coincidence he used that terminology, a war on poverty, in order to say we have to be ambitious. So that, I think, is actually something that probably Linda Weiss will talk more about, which I think is a very, very interesting point. What does it do also to the framings of these policies if we have to talk about security? But this is an opportunity, and this is the bit actually that I'm working on a lot in my new institute, which is how can we change that? How can we stop talking about it as a security or war problem and say things like, look, there's these sustainable development goals. There's 17 of them. Sometimes to me, they look like a shopping list. But actually, what's nice is that all the countries, apparently many countries, have agreed to them. What would it mean to tackle those as missions? You know, going to the moon was a mission that required many different sectors to innovate, even clothing. So it's not an old style industrial policy. It required lots of different public agencies. It required about 500 homework problems underneath it. So a lot of enabling and different types of bottom up experimentation. What it, would it mean to have mission oriented, Apollo like <laughs> missions with clear targets that we can you know, see what's happening along the way around those social kind of grand challenges slash sustainable development goals. And this to me is sort of the, the more revolutionary bit, which is, you know, given that we could do it to go to the moon, why don't we do it for these social problems? And a colleague of mine, very smart man, Dick Nelson, wrote a book called The Moon and the Ghetto. How could we go to the moon and we can't solve the ghetto problem? And is it a technological problem? Of course not. But, you know, we should have great ambition and targets and mission orientation also in those goals. But your, your, your other question related to that, which is about the processes, you know, top down or bottom up, the democratization issue, I think, um, again, I'm, not, I'm no expert, actually. You're much more the expert, so I want to hear what you think. Um, but, you know, what's interesting is I see what's happening today in Germany as a green mission. The energy vende policy is very mission oriented, very clear targets. It's not just battling climate change. And it's interesting precisely because on the one hand, it was top down, kind of directed from government, Merkel, but actually the consensus that was built in Germany that even allowed her to have a green vision and a green mission came from movements. You know, the Green Party and the Green Movements in Germany, to me that's a, another model, a different type of model, both equally interesting to learn from. It's not one or the other. The Apollo model is very interesting today, again, so we don't get into a list of sectors we need to approach, but missions, going to the moon, 10 different sectors, health and climate change, lots of different sectors, not just a list. But also, you know, what does it mean to actually allow the movements in civil society to form the kind of consensus around what the big new missions should be? And then, of course, you do need some level of directed planning to actually make it a national mission. But also, and again, this is the other side of the democratization point, not just about civil society, but allow lots of different actors actually to experiment, to explore. As I said, going to the moon, there was about 500 homework problems, and that's where the interesting bottom-up stuff happened. Um, and I could go on, but I do feel like we should open it up a bit. But let me just say that this secular stagnation kind of view of the world, which is that somehow the problem is now that there's you know less to innovate, or also part of their story is part of what you said, which is, oh, all the innovation in the past happened because of the Cold War, and now we're in a different era. Also, most of what could be you know, discovered has been, and we have to just accept this lower growth. This actual issue that one of the key uh, crises we face today is this ultra-financialized form of capitalism, which is very different from the form of capitalism we had in the Man on Moon era, is a really deep point. Bell Labs which was one of the most uh, innovative laboratories inside a private company, AT&T, did not come about simply because AT&T woke up one day and said, mm, I'm going to be cool and innovate. They were asked to by government. They were a monopoly. And the, the idea was monopoly not granted from God, <laughs> but from the public, right? A, a, a government granted monopoly in the exchange, in the relationship to have more symbiosis was that those profits had to be reinvested back into the economy and into innovation and big innovation beyond telecoms. And that's where Bell Labs came from. We don't have that kind of 
again, healthy tension today between public and private. And that's something that we could learn from from that era. But you don't learn as a cut and paste, do exactly what happened in Bell Labs, but more the, the bigger category, which is how do we create better deals? It's not just a new deal we need, a green new deal, but literally new types of contracts, new types of conditions that really shape these relationships to be more interesting. Does anyone have any questions? If not, as you could see, I had a lot, but yeah, let's. Uh. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. Thank you so much for the slide that you have about the iPod. Uh, I use it a lot, <laughs> and my friends use it a lot, so thanks. It's very popular. <laughs> uh, my question is about policies. I mean, uh, we all know uh, the success of the governments in creating general purpose technologies. Um, here in Europe, we had some organizations that have been very successful, like CERN, mm -hmm. and everybody acknowledged that since ever. Maybe Trump not, but everybody else probably, yes. <laughs> And uh, this is a, a good one. Uh, our problem is, since many years on policies, this innovation paradox that has been coined 30 years ago. Only a few ones have been successful. SBIR has been successful, but SBIR is 20, 30 years old. It has been copied everywhere, well, not in Spain, but everywhere else in Spain uh, copies SBIR. Even the European Commission has copied SBIR and so Sorry, on. Sorry, copied what? The uh, SBIR policy, the SBIR, the American SBIR policy. The small Sorry, the business. SBIR? Yeah, oh, SBIR. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, you had that in yeah. Netherlands, you had that in Finland, you had that in Belgium, mm -hmm. you had that in UK, you had that in the European Commission, Leslie, and that worked. Mm -hmm. But most of the policies, what happened is that, uh, well, they are very conductive to very liberal uh, types of outcomes. This kind of, I lend money and then I don't have a participation and so on. And these ones work, somehow. But the outcomes are not aligned with the public good or, the, or with the public interest. The outcomes are probably uh, misaligned with that, and this misalignment is, going, is getting greater and greater. So we need policies that work, that are aligned. Mm -hmm. Because if not, well, the others, because of work, they, they will work well. Uh, do you have any insight on that? The policies, because so far, mm -hmm. well, European projects, forget it. <laughs> it didn't mm -hmm. work. We have so, very, so few policies that work on that. Okay. So thank you. I thought I had sort of approached that, but maybe I'll just say quickly what I thought I had said around that, which is that you have different countries which then obsess about one part of that innovation chain. The classic thing is precisely, oh, there's a science paradox. You know, we have great science, but somehow it doesn't produce innovation. Oh, that means we don't have enough venture capital. So funds of funds and different types also of SME programs, as though it was the SMEs, you know, the garage tinkering SMEs that created all the growth. Uh, very few SMEs are even interested in innovating about this, you know, some different studies have found it's between sort of four and 6% of the SME small business community, so small and medium enterprises, are even interested to, to collaborate, for example, around these innovation challenges. And yet you have many countries, including my own, Italy, with different policies around the piccola impresa, and all the cute little piccola impresa. Most small companies are not very efficient, not very productive, not very innovative, and often even treat their workers not very well. So instead of mythologizing them and spraying all this support to SMEs, we should have much more directed support for the few SMEs that are even interested. And what those SMEs need is patient, long-term, committed finance. Venture capital is very exit-driven, wanting the returns in three or five years with a buyout or an IPO. That has caused huge problems in areas like, bi like um, biotechnology. So some countries like you know, Israel that have uh, provided patient finance through the Yasma program, another big problematic country in terms of the military industrial complex, but again, just a fact, they do have the patient finance. I would actually argue that today in countries like the UK, we don't have patient finance. So we might have SME policy that you mentioned, but because we obsess about the SMEs or obsess about the VCs, we actually don't get, again, that full kind of systematic support across the whole chain, but also don't then get the right support mechanisms. No? So inpatient finance doesn't work. But I think, you know, you mentioned Europe, and it just really is important because this is a huge implication of what I'm saying is the real differences in Europe are not, and by the way, you can't have a European Union with such huge differences in competitiveness and growth, no? Uh, the huge differences between the core and the periphery are precisely due 
to these kinds of investments. So Italy, for the last 20 years, has had a lower deficit than Germany. You know, radical, wow, do you know that? Because this is not what you've been told. <laughs> uh, what has happened in Italy is zero growth in productivity, zero growth actually even in almost in its GDP, but mainly in the productivity, precisely because they didn't have the kinds of investments instead that have been happening in Germany. So patient finance through the KFW, Fraunhofer Institutes, which we pretended to copy in the UK. You mentioned what we do in the UK, but we spend 10 times less than Germany on them. Not just high R&D to GDP in Germany, but directed through big ambitious policies like Energy Vent. If that was part of the recipe to the pigs, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, I'm allowed to say it because I'm Italian. If, if you had a German here saying the bunch of you know, lazy pigs, this is a, a, a word by Goldman Sachs. You know, If that was the recipe being forced down the throat of Greece today, which again has this big bailout, it would be a very different story. Instead, the narrative is the Schroeder reforms, you know, cutting uh, uh, wages and reducing unit labor costs. What Schroeder did in the 1990s, and the left hasn't said this enough, what he did was negotiate with the trade unions for unit labor costs to be, if you want, flatter, um, to preserve employment. Forget whether that was good or bad, but it was done for employment. In fact, you didn't have mass unemployment after East and West United because of, one could say, perhaps that. What they did for competitiveness, even just after the crisis, was increase their spending on things like R&D, but also education by 15%. Spain has cut its publicly funded R&D by 40% in order to stick to this 3% criteria, which, as I said in the beginning, has never been the problem. Italy has had a low deficit, but because it, you know, the, the productivity has not been rising, GDP doesn't, so the relationship between debt and GDP, which matters more than the deficit, can in theory go to infinity, because the denominator is not growing. And anyway, really looking carefully at what is different between Germany and Denmark and Italy and Spain and Greece, I think you'd have a different conclusion from what you just said. It's not true that all the countries are doing equal things. Denmark, this is my last sentence, today is the number one provider of high-tech services to China's green economy. And China's spending 1.7 trillion on green. How Denmark did that is a very interesting story, and it's not through patchy green policies, start, stop, feed in tariffs like the UK. So this need for mission-oriented, systematic, wholesome kind of policies I think you were talking about, and you know, attention to the whole innovation chain, it's just not true that it's being done you know, across Europe in the same way and somehow it doesn't work. Huge heterogeneity that we should be learning from and using it to try to get to be more equal in competitiveness instead of this increasing divergence, which then allows populist politics to blame it all on the immigrants. Let's take a few questions at once because we probably have about 10 minutes left. So who wants to go next? Yes, in the thank you. back, yes. Yeah, thank you. Well, I would like to introduce another uh, actor in this story, is the pharmaceutical industry, as I uh, assume that the, it's an important part of this uh, situation. And um, in this sense, you know that we have uh, uh, new drugs introduced, biological drugs that have a very, very high cost, and I'm um, talking about oncology, orphan drugs, and all this kind. Uh, of uh, innovative uh, drugs that probably they can ruin an, a, a health system because it's so so expensive that probably we cannot pay this in in some years. Uh, as you know, there are some experiences like resharing that something so simple like to pay only if it works. It may be very simple the the. the the element, but it's very difficult to, or it has some limitations to, to follow it and to to have it implemented in all places. So I would like to to know if you have any idea or how to manage with this important problem that it's uh, about health, and some questions about uh, cost benefit because some of these drugs really they have a ratio, a low ratio. Thank you very much. Do we have someone else who wants to ask a question? Yes, right there. Just wait for the mic. Hi. Um, it seems that the entrepreneurial state you're talking about is uh, comprised of, among other things, uh, one component which is that sort of uh, direct investment, direct public investments, and another which is about facilitating and sort of cooperating with the private sector 
uh, through networks and relationships and all that. And I was wondering with respect to this, um, the first component, and this is bound to be something you've talked about before, um, what your thoughts are on uh, potential um, violations of the constraints that are imposed by um, Euros, th things like Eurozone uh, debt rules and so on. And finally, I'd, I'd like to ask you about um, this, the, 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 the aspect of your talk regarding the so socialization of rewards. It seems that um, you put a lot of hope on the fact that because the state will be doing more investments, that that's like a, a vehicle, an opportunity to socialize rewards through the state. I was wondering, what is your openness um, about other types of um, political economies along the forms of what James Mead had in mind when he spoke uh, of a property-owning democracy? What are your thoughts? Uh, a property-owning democracy? So political economies that, um, you know, market economies which are inherently more egalitarian in the sense that uh, assets are more dispersed throughout the population and, uh, and so on. Thank you. Okay, one last question there in the back and then we'll give Mariana five minutes at least to answer. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I'm only a tourist here, um, jumped into this uh, lecture, but On I'm very pleased. By accident, were you here for an exhibit? Well, I'm a <laughs> Dutch uh, Slovenian, born in Slovenia of mixed origin, uh, environmental sociologist by profession. You see, I'm gray, so I'm 56, uh, having quite kilometers done in environmentalism. So my question is actually uh, something regarding to what I hear here, like innovation and then climate changes and this. Because actually this seems like there is a certain conflict which overwhelms the, the scheme that you have been performed. So the, the conflict between the public and the private sector, which I don't really agree with, uh, I think both uh, they have in common and all people in the world have in common and also in the title here uh, in the innovation there is the core of everything is the information. Uh, and when there is the information, I mean all the policies and, and the economy, they are actually built upon the information, it doesn't matter what kind of it is. But uh, as you mentioned, uh, the states like who are really uh, funding and not really, let's say, restricting itself in the uh, the financing of the of the sectors which are essential for their economy, thus for the society. I think they have something uh, which is very obvious. Uh, they are very strong in defining, and I think this is the matter actually uh, which makes also the difference between when we speak ju in general or we speak just very analytical, is that defining uh, risks actually is what also produces some kind of common sense and thus eliminates uh, the impression of being a so uh, society, uh, let's say, uh, gapped between the public and the private sector. So, I like the Germany sorry, and the Netherlands, uh, they have, a, have, have defined very, very clearly. So I will come to the now to the point. No, no, they we have, don't have time. Sorry, we're they like, have defined very she has clearly to 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 the <laughs> definition of environmental <laughs> risk in the matter of climate change, which is uh, the rise of uh, sea level. That includes also Norway, and thus here are not mentioned the the states, we, we which are sorry, very very progressive. I and uh, <laughs> she has a plane, and so do I. So yeah. it's a very hard deadline. Uh, yeah, so in respect of our not missing the plane, I'll be super quick, but it's not just very respectful to you because the questions were great. So first with big pharma, I mean, this is the area I have sort of a chapter in the book, but also a big project with others um, working on precisely that. And I'll just say two quick things on that. You know, what we should be doing is having an ambition, mission around the healthcare system and then work backwards and actually think about how to work along the innovation chain with the different actors in a particular way instead of what we currently have, which is, for example, lots of public funding in the beginning, 32 billion a year in, just in the US, and then allowing different actors to come in when they want, sort of free riding on it, but also then allowing the price system to just sort of happen on its own so the prices of the drugs do not even reflect that public contribution. But on top of that, 
why with these public actors, why are they even accepting the definition of what the market is? There's too much research, too much public uh, attention to things like drugs, the medicines, not enough on areas like lifestyle, which would be actually quite important. The profit opportunities are not as great, but this whole market shaping, market creating point is also about having the guts, the courage, the ambition, the vision, the dreams to reshape and redefine what the market even is. Even is. Markets are outcomes, right? Um, second, this whole, the, the question about directing, I think, well, just, you know, it's ironic that we have the wrong theory of competition. Schumpeter, actually Marx before, half of what's in Schumpeter was already in Marx. Marx and Schumpeter taught us that actually firms are competing for market share, differentiating themselves through innovation. So this constant process of heterogeneity that's formed from competition should, first of all, be understood in economic theory, but we have the wrong economic theory that talks about averages and somehow, you know, a perfect competition and disequilibria is just a transient state. But the other point there is that in order to compete through innovation, you need patient long-term finance. That finance is coming where it is coming out of public funds. And then ironically in Europe, we call that against competition, right? So we have the wrong theory of competition then calling the pots of money that actually allow innovation-driven competition, not the Walmart kind of competition, as anti-competitive. But ironically, it's, you know, not everyone is held to account in the same way. So the KfW in Germany, which I've mentioned, the public bank, because it was set up with the Marshall Fund, is allowed to do all sorts of things, with the, which the equivalent bank, say in Italy, would be called anti-competitive. And I mean, that's just a historical, very curious fact. But we do, I think, in Europe, if we want to compete through innovation, we have to be much more careful and design these state aid regulations and even do the regulations in such a way that don't dismiss completely actually where com competition sort of comes from. Um, the question about, you know, basically what I interpret as varieties of capitalism with the Mead uh, question. I'm not a big fan of the whole kind of crowdfunding kind of model. I think it's interesting to look at it precisely because of the questions it raises. What are the different models, the distributed models that you might have of different actors and even finance, you know, different types of finance perhaps uh, 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 working in different ways in terms of the interactions and where it's coming from the community, community financing. But currently at least, it's a drop in the ocean. You know, the patient long-term finance for the big green missions, and if we want to tackle green, we better understand, you know, what the amount of finance, but also where it's actually coming from, instead of just kind of dreaming up a completely new financial system, it is coming actually from very big pots of money, whether it's in public banks or pension funds, and how to democratize those precisely through these issues. If it's pensions you know, coming from the public purse, then why don't we have a more interesting understanding of what these pension funds should be investing in precisely in areas like green, but the sovereign wealth funds as well, like in Norway. The fact that so much of these sovereign wealth funds are being reinvested in real estate is, is, is a crime, <laughs> right? Because it's taking profits out of the current sort of status quo of public uh, resources and then investing it in this ultra financialized area. Of course, there are debates like this around the sovereign wealth funds. It's not that it's either that or crowd financing, but I think in some ways, you know, the, the, there's a, in terms of myths, there's, I think the whole crowd financing thing itself has become a bit of a myth. Lastly, the question on, you know, basically that it's not about state versus private, but information and the networks, I would completely agree. But my whole point is in order to have proper public private partnerships, we better have interesting bits of the public sector working with interesting bits of the private sector. And while we have these business schools that talk about the knowledge creation process through decision sciences, organizational behavior, strategic management for the private sector, because we've dismissed the role of the state as anything more than fixing and facilitating and enabling, we haven't thought about that need to explore those knowledge creation processes. And if anything, the increasing trend of outsourcing and privatizing is really hurting the public bit, which then doesn't act as a proper partner, as well as it gets cheated. <laughs> uh, and what's happening, by the way, in space, the space economy, all the new private actors in space, I encourage you to look at just how bad and problematic those partnerships are, where Novartis is working for free on the International Space Station and is even being allowed to patent uh, research it's doing on this publicly funded infrastructure, and it's a scandal. And it's not about state versus business, but how to work together more interestingly. 
we got to run to the airport. We do. <laughs> no, not literally, but thank you very much for coming. <laughs>